Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our um, webinar on the SB12 Learning Community Paving Pathways for College Transitions for Foster Youth. Uh, we will begin at 10 a.m. So we will begin promptly here in about a minute. Okay, and it is 10 a.m. and I'm going to begin. Again, good morning, everyone. My name is Tia and I am from John Burton Advocates for Youth. And again, thank you for joining us for our, on our webinar this morning on the SB12 Learning Community um, Paving Pathways for College Transitions for, for Foster Youth. Um, this, just to go over some very quick logistics, if you've never used the webinar platform before, there is a call-in number that you can um, use that is displayed here. The presentation materials are located in the handout section um, that you can download. It is a PDF version of our PowerPoint that we will be using today. And you'll also be able to get the materials from our website at jba4youth.org and under training um, research and training. Um, and we'll also be sending out a follow-up email um, with the materials. Uh, and then at the end of our presentation, you will be able to ask questions um, by typing it into the questions panel, um, typing in your question, and then clicking send. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm actually going to transition and hand it over to Debbie Rauscher, who is going to explain some of the context and um, reasoning behind the SB12 learning community and um, the importance of college um, support. Great, thank you so much. Um, one thing I'll just add in terms of logistics is that there is a copy of the PowerPoint presentation available in the handouts in your control panel. So I know some people like to be able to print it out and take notes uh, or follow along that way. So if you do want to download a copy of the PowerPoint presentation to have for now or later, um, in addition to it being available on the website, you can go ahead and download it from the control panel at any time. So, uh, as Tia has mentioned, my name is Debbie Rauscher, and I am the Education Director with John Burton Advocates for Youth, and I'm very excited to see how many folks are joining us on the webinar this morning um, and how much interest there is in this very important topic. So, um, SB 12, as Tia is going to talk about a little bit later, was a bill that John Burton Advocates for Youth passed. Uh, to help support foster youth to be successful in college. This is an effort that we at John Burton Advocates for Youth have been involved with for a number of years. And I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of background about why we are putting so much emphasis on college in the first place. So first thing I'll say is that when we here at JBay talk about the concept of college or post-secondary education, we are not limiting that to a traditional four-year bachelor's degree uh, path. So post-secondary education includes not just bachelor's degree, but uh, two-year associate degrees, career and technical education pathways, career training options. And so, you know, in particular at the community colleges, there's so many different pathways and credential programs and career training programs. And we put, that's all in the bucket of what when we use the word college um, we're really talking about all of those different pathways so why do we think this is so important well the chart that's on your screen right now um, shows some data about the change in jobs over the last uh, <clears throat> 10 years or so and so what you can see this this kind of chart starts during the Great Recession, shows what happened to jobs during that period, and then what has happened during the post-recession recovery. So the blue line at the top of the chart uh, is jobs that require a bachelor's degree or higher. 
And you can see there that during the recession, there was actually very little, uh, if any, job loss. And then since the recession, just in the last few years, uh, there's been a tremendous growth in the number of jobs available to people with a bachelor's degree or higher. So 8.4 million jobs between uh, 2010 and 2017. If you look at the orange line, those are jobs that require an associate's degree, so a two-year degree or some college. And you can see that there was a dip during the recession, about 1.8 million jobs lost. But then pretty much full recovery since the recession, uh, 3.1 million jobs were regained for a net job growth in uh, jobs that require an associate's degree. The green line down at the bottom are jobs that require a high school diploma or less. And you can see that during the recession, there was a loss of 5.6 million jobs and pretty much no recovery of those jobs. So, you know, very, very small, 80,000 jobs gained in the recovery, but essentially all 5.6 million of those jobs never came back after the recession. And so this really brings home why it's so important that all young people gain some sort of post-secondary credential. And for our foster youth, you know, I think in the past, historically, there's sort of been a perception that if we get them through high school, our job is done and that's a success. And of course, we want them to graduate high school, absolutely, but we can't stop there. Um, the, the work that happens in supporting foster youth, in particular with the implementation of extended foster care in the last few years and the fact that foster youth now do remain the responsibility of child welfare agencies, often through age 21. Um, it really changes the game in terms of what kind of support is really necessary within child welfare systems to support these young people. Uh, there's a lot of data as well about the differences in not only unemployment rates, but salaries based on post-secondary attainment. And it's, it's a clear and has been consistent throughout time um, for the last many years that the more education a young person has as they enter adulthood, the more money they make, the more likely they are to be self-sufficient, the less likely they are to uh, rely on public benefits. There's a whole host of health indicators and life satisfaction indicators that are linked to post-secondary education. Next slide. So what do we know about um, foster youth and college and how foster youth are sort of connecting to post-secondary education currently? So the first thing we know is that the vast majority of foster youth have a desire to go to college. And so when th there's been many different surveys done over the years asking foster youth the question, um, what is the highest level of education that you aspire to complete? And 86%, it's pretty consistent, um, that it's in the 85 to 90 percent range of foster youth express a desire to go to college. However, what data also tells us is that only about 55 percent of those youth end up enrolling in college. Now, this is not a, a terrible number, I would say. You know, we want every foster youth who has a desire to go to college to be able to attend. Um, but 55 percent uh, of foster youth enrolling in college, you know, this is a number that has been going up and um, there's some evidence that we as a system are improving our ability to support foster youth to actually step foot through the door into college in the first place. Where we're really falling down is how many are completing a degree. So uh, studies uh, from a few years ago looked at degree completion of foster youth by age 26, found that only 8% of them had a two or four year degree by age 26. So this is consistent with some of the other research that's been coming out through the CalUse study here in California, where we're seeing that um, you know, we're getting them in the door, we're doing a better job of that, but once they get there, they're still really struggling and are not necessarily uh, completing a degree or getting a credential. Next slide. So some kind of closer to home data, um, we have access to a system called the CalPass Plus system, which provides data for foster youth specifically in the community college system. Community college system is where 85% of foster youth are enrolled. Um, and so while we do of course have foster youth in the university systems, the vast majority uh, are in the community college system. So we do 
uh, you know, focus a lot on that data. And you can see from the graph uh, on your screen that there is a big gap in how many foster youth achieve a 2.0 grade point average versus non-foster youth. And the 2.0 grade point average is really a crucial data point because maintaining a 2.0 GPA is required to maintain financial aid. And so, you know, uh, just under half of foster youth are not, being, are not maintaining this 2.0 GPA when they get to community college. Next slide. Uh, course success rate, this is another data point we look at. Again, you can see um, you know, pretty significant gaps in course success rate between foster youth and non-foster youth. So again, this is just an indicator uh, that we're not doing all that we can to support foster youth once they arrive at a community college to be successful there. Next slide. So some good news. Um, financial aid is one of the things that makes the biggest difference. So it's complicated. There's a number of different factors uh, in terms of what foster youth need to be successful in college, but there's just a host of data that's come in in recent years demonstrating that financial aid is one of the key pieces, if not the key piece, to foster youth being successful in college. It's it's not surprising, you know, if, if a young person doesn't have uh, the financial resources, then they have to work full time while they're going to college, or they might end up homeless. Um, and what the data shows is that uh, th there was a study done a couple of years ago specifically looking at community college students in California who are low income. And it found that of those who received $7,500 or more in financial aid, 49% of them ultimately transferred or graduated. And for those students who received between $1,000 and $2,500 in financial aid, just 17% transferred or graduated. So. Uh, access to financial aid is just key for low-income students in general to be successful. Next slide. So the good news, um, Educational Results Partnership, which is an organization that we partner with, they manage the CalPass Plus system that I mentioned recently, uh, just came out with a new publication called Pipeline to Success. And they looked at a number of different aspects of foster youth college um, outcomes and did complicated and sophisticated, sophisticated statistical analysis uh, to hone in on what were the factors that seemed to have an impact on outcomes like GPA and unit completion. So the first thing they found was that Pell Grants, which is the largest form of financial aid, uh, federal financial aid available to low-income students. Um, students who received a Pell Grant when you controlled for other factors had a 0.07 higher GPA and completed on average 2.12 more units. The other data point that they found uh, was around student support grants. So these are other forms of financial aid like grants from an EOPS or Next Up program. These are support programs at the community colleges or receipt of a Chafee grant. Uh, and they found that students who received some other form of financial aid also experienced uh, increase in GPA as well as additional units completed. Another study, if we go to the next slide, um, the Cal Grant study, which people might be familiar with, this is a study that's being spearheaded through the University of Chicago, looking at a whole range of outcomes for youth who are participating in extended foster care. They took a look at specifically foster youth who are receiving a Chafee grant at college and found that foster youth who receive a Chafee grant are four times more likely to persist through their first year of college than those who do not receive the grant. So, if you're not convinced already, um, you know, there's just an abundance of evidence that financial aid is so important. And if foster youth are arriving at college uh, and they haven't had the support needed for them to actually get all of the financial aid that they should qualify for, we're really doing them a huge disservice and the likelihood of success goes down dramatically. So, what do we know about whether or not foster youth do receive financial aid? That's sort of the next question. So we know it helps, um, but are they getting it? So the unfortunate answer is not as much as we would like. So you can see here from this chart, 
the Promise Grant Fee Waiver is a program at the community colleges, used to be called the, the BOG Fee Waiver, Board of Governors Fee Waiver, that provides free tuition to low-income students. The eligibility in terms of income is very similar to that of the, Fel the Pell Grant, which is the federal financial aid program. The Pell Grant provides funding for non-tuition costs, so it gives around uh, six or seven thousand dollars to a full-time student for other costs like housing and books and food and such. And uh, almost 80 percent of students who have been identified as foster youth in the community college system qualify for the Promise Grant. This is of first-year students. Um, however, less than half of those same students were getting a Pell Grant. So that gap there uh, tells us that you know, these students meet the income criteria. They're first-year students, so they haven't had an opportunity to lose the financial aid yet because of uh, issues with academic progress or anything. They should be all, you know, everybody who's getting that Promise Grant should be coming in with a Pell Grant but we're seeing this gap. So this really sparked for us at JB when we first saw this data a few years ago, this really sparked our efforts around financial aid. And for those of you who have been tracking the work that we've been doing at JB over the past several years, you're probably aware that we've really been trying to hone in on this question of getting foster youth access to these forms of financial aid, uh, expanding access to the Cal Grant program, which is the state financial aid source, making more Chafee funds available to students, and I think most importantly, efforts to ensure that foster youth have the support that they need to get through this process. Because what our, uh, our sort of assumption, our supposition on why we see this gap is that for the Promise Grant, you can apply for a Promise Grant without submitting the full FAFSA. It's much simpler. You don't have to go through all the hoops and the paperwork and everything to get that Promise Grant. The Pell Grant, however, you do. You have to submit a FAFSA. You might get flagged for verification. You, need, you have to not just submit the FAFSA, but, but submit it correctly. And so a lot of foster youth are getting lost in that process, not submitting that FAFSA or not doing the, the necessary follow-up on it to get that federal financial aid that's so crucial. So that really is kind of what has sparked our efforts to say, okay, we've got this big FAFSA problem here. Um, we need to figure out how do we make sure that foster youth are getting the support that they need while they're in high school, while they're still in the child welfare system to get that FAFSA done so that once they arrive at college, their financial aid is in place, they've got everything that they qualify for, they're good to go, and we're really starting them out in a place where they, they can be successful in college. Next slide. I'm gonna now turn it back over to Tia. So that was sort of the background on why we're doing all of this work around financial aid. Um, and Tia is gonna talk specifically about SB12, the SB12 learning community, and what we've got coming up in the months ahead. Great, thank you so much, Debbie. And again, good morning, everyone. My name is Tia, and I am the project lead over here at John Burton Advocates for Youth that is um, leading the work here for the SB12 learning community. Um, so Debbie just provided some really valuable information that led to the advocacy of and passage of SB12. So there's numerous entities that can support the youth to complete the financial aid application and the college application. Um, and as we can see here on the screen, there are multiple people that have the resources and can do this. Um, what can tend to happen though, is that there is an assumption um, and typically a well-intended assumption that one of these or multiple entities are already doing the work already, but there's not a coordinated effort to make sure that, let's say ILP is talking with the social worker to make say, hey, yes, we have completed an application. Um, typically this is because People are busy. Um, there's a lot of competing priorities. You know, obviously, college applications is not the only thing that is a priority for these. And so, there's a lot of well-meaning reasons why coordination may not actually be at the forefront here. Um, however, what does end up happening is that the youth ends up being 
really confused in this process. They end up maybe not completing the application. They may not realize that maybe no one's talking to them about it because there's an assumption that someone else has talked to them about it um, and about completing those applications and they may not finish it or they finish it and it's wrong um, and they're not sure who to turn to to actually get the correct information or maybe someone did help them complete it but because they're not aware of their unique circumstances, maybe it was again completed wrong or a extra follow-up was needed that they couldn't do. And so this is really where SB12 comes in, right? So SB12, excuse me, um, is requiring that any foster youth that is in the child welfare system at the age of 16 or older, that a case plan identifies who is going to assist the youth with college applications and financial aid applications. And again, as Debbie had mentioned in the previous slides, and I had just mentioned, this is really critical so that youth know who to turn to and who you as the child welfare worker or maybe a high school counselor um, can know who is going to help and support this youth. So maybe your county has already started implementing SB 12. Maybe you are in the middle of trying to figure out how are we going to implement SB 12. Um, last year, we actually released a toolkit, an SB 12 social worker toolkit um, that really gave some really great um, concrete step-by-steps on where to actually implement it. So I'm gonna go over and cover very briefly what was in that guide. Um, again, you can find that guide on jbay.org. Um, um, it is the SB 12 social worker toolkit. So the first step is really identifying the individual. So first we need to make sure um, who is there already in the youth life that is supporting the youth. So this is where the youth is at the center of the conversation um, and really can be done in a two-step process. Okay, so the first step is who is reliable in the youth life currently? Okay, so here on your screen are some examples. Maybe it's a resource parent, it's a caregiver, maybe it's a family member or a mentor, it's the high school counselor. And this is someone that the youth has identified that they want to help support them through this process or that they know that they can trust them to go to them to support. And while these are three examples, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, so maybe um, if you can't identify someone, this is where we move on to step two. And you can think of people that are in your local county community that you can leverage to support and to support the youth. Um, so if there are, uh, excuse me, um, so here are maybe some three examples. There's CASAs that are in the community, ILP, the Independent Living Program, maybe the local college's foster youth support program. Um, these are all entities that could potentially support the youth in this. But this also means that you need to engage with those um, with those resources, right? You need to have a working relationship with those resources. You need to know who to contact. Okay, so if you're sitting there and you're wondering, well, I'm not 100% sure who I can contact or maybe who I can trust to be reliable to support the youth, this is an opportunity to actually develop and grow and support the local network in your county. Okay, so I'm actually gonna go through three examples of what this can potentially look like in real life. So the first step, uh, the first entity or the first organization would be the Court Appointed Special Advocates or CASAs. Okay, so CASAs are, um, they're volunteers that are appointed and are um, can legally meet with the youth, that have access to their records, um, and they're meeting with them regularly. And because they're volunteers, they're engaged and they are invested in the youth and their well-being. Okay? So they are currently, they currently go through trainings, they go through um, continued trainings once they are brought on board, um, and so they are are a really great source to engage in this process and to identify as someone who can potentially support them with these um, applications. Okay, now, maybe you're not 100% sure what is happening as far as the trainings in that county. Um, so maybe um, this can be an opportunity of finding out what trainings are currently being offered and seeing if college applications and matriculation processes are being part of that training. And if not, how can we insert that so that all CASAs in the county are prepared to support students? so that you can feel confident that you are referring to that student to their CASA and you know they're getting accurate information. The Foster Services Coordinating Program could be another space. This is, the, um, this is also known as the FYSCPs. The FYCPs are located within the county offices of education um, and they're based in each county. And they're tasked with coordinating educational services for the foster youth that are in their county, um, including post-secondary matriculation support. So that's college application and financial aid support. 
Um, FYSCPs have access to databases that can track the matriculation processes, such as financial aid completion um, and FAFSA completion, um, and they are regularly collaborating with social workers, community-based organizations, child welfare partners, um, and making sure that the youth are feeling supported in all steps in the educational process and not necessarily just college, right? So these, this is also another entity that you want to engage with, find out um, what their trainings look like. Or is there uh, what are they providing trainings already that you can invite your other local partners to? If you need student level data on FAFSA completion that you need to share with your identified individuals, engage the FYSCP program because they, um, they are the ones that will be able to support you with that information. Okay, and then finally, high school counselors. Okay, so high school counselors are already well versed in um, the college com application completion and FAFSA completion. Um, I know that in a lot of the work that I do, I have many conversations with county partners that um, are kind of under the assumption that high school counselors are already supporting them to complete the applications. And while this could be true, um, it's not necessarily the case school to school. High school counselor capacities look different school to school, um, county to county, and district to district, okay? And they may not actually are, they may not be well versed in information in regards to foster youth. So they may need to have additional resources, they may need, need additional trainings, um, and they just need to, may need to know who on their caseloads um, do they need to support the foster youth that are in their schools. So again, this is an opportunity to engage school districts and schools to make sure that they have the tools necessary to support the foster youth that are in their schools. And so the child and family team meetings or CFT meetings is also an opportunity to not only identify someone who can support the student, um, to identify the student, um, to identify who can support the youth, but also to, and once that person is identified, to bring them into those meetings. Okay, so the, again, the, so the meeting is team-based. Uh, it should always have the youth that is in the forefront. So this is, again, where you can have those meaningful conversations of who do you want to support you? Okay. And this is also a place where once they are identified and the, once the youth has identified someone, that the team can work on identifying goals. Okay. So this is where we can sit down and talk with the youth, with the identified individuals and the team that is um, part of their CFT teams and identify realistic goals. This is also where, on top of it, they can create concrete goals and steps to reach those post-secondary and career goals. So again, I know that Debbie had mentioned before that um, when we talk about post-secondary, um, we're talking about vocational school, apprenticeship programs, um, short-term certificate programs, um, in addition to the traditional two-year um, and four-year traditional pathways, okay? So maybe you have a youth that is really interested in receiving their union's card, okay? So what are the goals and what do they need to do in order to get that union card and to get the schooling to get that and who will be able to help them get there? So again, you wanna make sure that you're inviting the individual that is identified to support the youth. Um, this person should always be in com communication with because they're the ones that are gonna be doing the day-to-day -day work with the youth. Okay? They, and they, the youth needs to know that this is a person that they can go to um, so that they can support them in that process. Okay, and this is also an opportunity to identify what other supports and resources are needed. Okay, maybe the identified individual is really well versed in the financial aid process, but maybe we need to identify an additional individual that can support the college application process. So there could be more than one individual that is being identified and to support the youth. You know, going to college um, is not a, a one size fits all, right? There are multiple options, multiple things and steps that need to be done um, and multiple expertise that need to be leveraged on to get the youth there. So then there is also, you can also use the transitional independent living plan or the TILP um, to identify, um, you know, a plan to make sure that the youth feel supported. Um, and so this is really a great opportunity to um, help the youth with some goal planning, right? So you can use this TILP that can typically be done in a CFT meeting um, to create a transitional living plan, okay? So these plans are required to be addressed um, and revised as needed every three to six months once the youth is 14 or over. Um, and so creating a success, uh, excuse me, um, creating a successful plan has about four elements, okay? So the first element is going to be setting the goal, 
Okay, so this goal needs to be actionable. The youth needs to be invested. It needs to be meaningful to them. Okay, it's something that they have talked about. And again, goals can change, right? The youth can be really interested in going to one university, but then they've decided that they're interested in doing something else or they're adding on to things. So goals are going to change. Okay, um, and it has it needs to be specific. The next step is going to be the activities. So the activities that are related to that goal. So these need to be realistic um, and they need to be um, actionable, just like the goal. So they need to be, you know, maybe they need to be chunked in, maybe there needs to be multiple activities that need to be included into going into that goal. Okay, so then also the, again, we're talking with our identified individuals, you need to identify who is going to be responsible in supporting that youth. Most of the time, it'll be the, ind the identified individual from their case plan, um, but it can also be additional parties as well. At the very least, the identified individuals should know what is um, know what the goals and the activities are, because they even if they're not the identified person to support the student in this particular goal, maybe they are the ones that are going to be doing the check-in and the follow-up and um, supporting the youth with that and uh, the additional identified person. And finally, there needs to be a planned completion date. So a realistic time to check in and complete the goal. Um, and if the youth comes back and they did not achieve the goal, then to identify the barriers that prevented them from doing it, right? So maybe they uh, were supposed to contact someone, but they we realized that they didn't actually have access to a cell phone at the time or a phone at the time to contact that person. And so instead of reprimanding and being upset with the youth that they didn't hit that goal, figuring out what barriers need to be removed and what additional support is needed to support that youth to do the goal, and then start the process all over again. Okay, so I spoke, spoke very broadly about this process. So I'm gonna go through a very quick sample of what this can actually look like. Okay, so the goal in this, um, in this situation is going to be that the youth wants to get accepted um, into UC Riverside. Um, the, maybe, we're, maybe this is a, a high school sophomore, um, and so they are going to need to be meeting with their high school counselor to review their transcripts to see which additional classes that they need um, as they plan to go through their the rest of their high school education. Okay, and then the responsible care person that is um, the responsible party, um, maybe in this case it's the youth and the, uh, well, in all cases it's going to be the youth, but in this case it's also the caregiver. So the caregiver, maybe they're also the identified individual, they, the caregiver may want to be in on the meeting. Um, they may want to make sure that the youth is asking the right questions and to support the youth. Um, and so here's where we want to make sure, again, that we clearly identify who is also responsible in this party in addition to the youth. And then, of course, a completion plan. Um, and then, again, if for some reason the youth did not happen to meet that, maybe the counselor was booked or there's a bunch of different reasons why maybe a youth didn't get to that, um, figuring out what happened um, and removing those barriers for that youth. Okay, so we just kind of went over um, a little bit of what was what can be found within our um, SB12 toolkit. Um, and so right now I'm actually gonna go into the learning community specifically and um, kind of the logistics of that program. So the purpose of the learning community is to first, to support your county's implementation of SB 12. Um, we recognize that maybe there was some heart and then it was a little difficult, or um, maybe there's just been so much that has been happening in your county that there hasn't been some time to figure out exactly where to implement SB 12, um, in addition to maybe just updating some process and procedures. But maybe there's additional training that needs to be done. Um, maybe there's board motions that need to be passed. So we want to figure out with you um, how to support implementation in your county. Okay, and then also we want, the purpose of it is to develop and institutionalize protocols and procedures. Um, and so while we wanna make sure that even if the good work that is being completed by individuals um, and that person leaves, that no matter what, the protocols and the procedures that are happening in that county are consistent um, and they're institutionalized when people leave. So this means that, um, you know, all case plans are being updated, or maybe there's a tilt or a transitional living plan that is updated, um, or maybe the, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that this can look like, but we wanna make sure that the that development um, and institutionalization is happening in the county. 
Okay, and then also just to aid in collaboration and leveraging community partnerships. Um, I know a lot of communications that I have with counties is that um, you know, the, sometimes it's not necessarily the information that they don't know. They're just not sure of who to talk to um, and how to get in contact with them and start the conversation. Um, and so this is where the learning community and with my help um, and with some of Debbie's help, that we will begin to um, aid your collaboration and start leveraging those community partnerships that maybe you realize that, oh, we're, we may be lacking in um, supporting high school counselors or maybe we haven't engaged with CASAs as often as we should. So these are just a preview of what some of the things that we will discuss during the learning community. We, of course, talk about financial aid. We'll talk about college planning. We're gonna talk about um, career technical pathways and maybe non-traditional pathways. Um, I know that there are some youth that are non-diploma non -diploma track students, so how to support them and making sure that they can make informed decisions about what to do after high school. Um, we're gonna talk about what this, your CFT um, or your child and family team meetings and your transitional um, to independent living plans look like um, and seeing if maybe there needs to be some areas of adjustment. Um, and we're also gonna be looking at other counties' examples. Um, we're gonna be looking at A3G requirements. So in order for, um, in the state of California to go to a four-year public university, um, most students need to finish um, a set of classes. That's called the A3G requirements. And so when I've talked to a lot of county folks and in child welfare and beyond, um, they're not necessarily aware of it or they don't know how it works, right? And so we are gonna talk about what, um, what A3G requirements are um, and kind of the impact of what that can have on foster youth. Um, and there's much more that we are gonna talk about. Um, and I do wanna note that um, the areas of discussion with whoever we decide um, that we are going to be working with in the counties, this can change. So if we notice, note that there are areas that need to be talked, um, discussed, then those topics are going to be discussed. Um, and we'll bring in guest speakers and you know, we'll make sure that this is relevant to the counties that are participating. So what can you expect from us? We are currently developing a, a college transitions practice framework. Um, and so this framework will be available to you as a learning community and to the state as a whole. Um, but the learning community is really going to be, have an opportunity to take this frame framework and start and begin to implement the frameworks directly into their um, county policies and procedures. Okay, so you'll be able to get your hands into the framework and see how this is going to work within your county um, and have um, our resources um, to back that up. So you can also, we're going to be, we're, excuse me, we're going to have one in-person kickoff um, until we have identified exactly who um, is going to be um, in the learning community, we haven't decided on location, um, and then a couple slides here, I'll show, I will share the tentative date, but again, once we have identified who the counties are, that date might change, but at this point, it's mostly set in stone. Um, so we have one in-person kickoff. There's going to be at least two in-person or virtual technical assistants. Um, so this will be myself either coming to your county or we are talking on the phone or we are talking over a Zoom meeting. Um, and so I'm really talking about your county's practices and processes and procedures and seeing what support you as a county needs to implement SB 12. Okay. And then there's also going to be at least four virtual peer learning opportunities. So these will be hosted via Zoom. Um, they will be small group. Uh, we will have guest speakers. Um, you'll be able to ask your questions. We'll be sharing best practices. Um, and so it's really just an intimate um, conversation with the um, learning community members and ourselves to have a conversation about um, a particular topic and practices around that topic. Okay, and this learning community is going to be um, going over the course of about uh, a year and uh, about a year. And then, of course, access to all of JBase tools um, and resources, and likely we will be um, developing tools and resources together that you, of course, will have access to as well. So what is it that we would expect from you as the participant? Um, we really want active participation. So that means, you know, coming to those in-person, um, coming to that in-person kickoff, participating in the virtual um, meetings, um, just, you know, being having active participation and communication. Um, and then just a commitment to identifying and to create college going practices um, in the agency. Again, as Debbie has mentioned, historically, the emphasis has been to make sure that youth are getting um, out of high school. 
now that we want to make sure that this the emphasis is starting to change the culture of that and now change it more into a college going practice um, and culture and so you know shifting culture and shifting attitudes can be difficult um, we're not going to say that this is going to be an easy process um, however uh, with our support and our backing and our resources um, and your expertise I truly believe that that can be possible and so um, we do want to have your commitment to identifying um, and real practical things to make sure that college-going cultures um, are implemented in all policy and your policies and procedures in your county Okay, so then now how do you apply? So you complete the application that will be um, coming out here after the, um, within 24 hours of finishing this webinar, um, and then completing a commitment contract. So this commitment contract is really just your saying to our organization um, that you are committed to this work for this um, specific amount of time, which again, I'm going to share a, um, a timeline here with you soon. Um, and that should you, um, as the county individual, leave, that you will actually replace um, your replace um, your spot with someone else, right? So again, we want to make sure that these practices are institutionalized and that they're not only living with one or a few individuals. Okay. And again, though, so once the um, application is done, then we will send out a commitment contract once we have selected the counties that will be participating. So there's a timeline of events, so the application will open today. Um, applications will then close in a couple of weeks on February 21st. Uh, we will make our county selections um, by March 1st. I honestly, they likely will be sooner, but at least um, at the most at, um, by March 1st. Um, on April 2nd is our in-person kickoff. Again, the time and location of that kickoff is um, TBA at the moment. Um, and then again, we will have these peer learning opportunities and these will really be um, created with those counties that were selected. Um, and so this will be um, an opportunity that is going to go through um, 2021. Um, and so we're, I believe that this will, and Debbie will have to interrupt here to confirm this, um, but I believe that this is going to be going um, through June of next year. Okay. So at this point, we are going to open it up to Q&A. So if you have a question, um, go ahead and put it into the questions panel. Um, and then once you have typed in your question, you can hit send. Um, we're open for questions. And Debbie right, is going to actually so moderate is, this. Yeah, so we've got a few questions that have come in and feel free to continue to send in any questions you might have. Uh, the first is, does SB 12 apply to a youth who's uh, considered to be a foster youth, um, but who's under the jurisdiction of the probation system, and would a probation agency be eligible, eligible to participate in the learning community? Um, Debbie, and of course, please help me out with these since you are my um, on-site expert. Um, the answer is yes. Um, probation agencies are, um, and we want to have probation agencies um, to be participating in the learning community. Um, we are, we would love to have um, both um, social workers um, from the child welfare side and from the probation agencies um, from counties to participate. So if you are a county that wants to have um, both um, entities that are participating, we would love to have that. So next question, just a clarification on who can participate in the learning community. Is this something that's just open to child welfare and probation agencies or something that like a community organization could participate in? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so at, um, at this time, this is only open to um, child welfare and probation agencies and their workers. So if you are um, coming from a county office or maybe you're at a local um, community-based organization, um, this learning community is not open to you at this time. However, um, we may actually be leveraging and having guest speakers come in to discuss what their role is. Um, and so while you know, you wouldn't be able to participate as far as the larger learning community. We may call on some of those organizations to be guest speakers. And I'll just add to that, that if you are uh, with an organization that's not a county child welfare agency or probation agency, another way that you can have a role in this is if you feel like this is something that your county child welfare agency uh, should be participating in, 
you can absolutely forward this information along to them and encourage them to apply. They don't have to be on this webinar in order to apply to participate in the learning community. And once those counties are selected, um, although the focus will be on the child welfare agency slash probation agency and implementation of SB 12, we'll definitely be working with them around how they can connect with their community partners and bring them into the discussions and collaborations. So there's definitely a role for other folks uh, in the learning community if you can get your child welfare agency uh, to participate in it. Uh, next question is sort of a comment. Um, so I'll just sort of read what the, the comment is and, and I'll maybe say a couple words about it. So person commented that they would like to see a process put in place uh, that provides an opportunity for the resource home to ensure that foster youth have uh, access to a computer, access to a printer, and mentoring opportunities and contact with someone who will help them navigate through the transi transition process from high school to college. So we agree with all of those things. Those are all things that foster youth absolutely need access to in order to be successful through this process. And that's something uh, that definitely will be an area of conversation during the learning community and how counties can leverage other resources to bring that in. You know, there's, there's quite a lot out there to help support foster youth to get free access to laptops, uh, to cell phones, to smartphones, to data plans, uh, to mentoring programs. So that'll absolutely be part of the process to figure out how to bring all of those resources in. Uh, next question for you, Tia, is if you can uh, clarify how somebody uh, submits an application. Is there going to be a follow-up email, or is it through this webinar somehow? Um, so after this webinar, we will be sending out an application, um, and then we will be sending it up, um, contacting the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be sending out an electronic application um, via email that is going to be coming out after this webinar. Okay, so it's 24 just, hours. So they just take a, keep their eye out for that, and when they receive it, there'll be a link to complete the application. Um, so here's a question about, this is an interesting question. I'm not actually totally sure that we have an answer yet. Um, but the question is from somebody with a state agency, um, the foster care ombudsman person, and whether they can participate in the learning community and how uh, the state child welfare agencies can assist counties in this work. You want to answer that or do you want me to, me to take that one? I would say take it, Debbie. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a great question and I'll be honest, um, I don't know that we've actually sort of contemplated that piece, but I am very intrigued um, and would am very interested in talking more with, uh, we have had some communication with CDSS about this. Um, but not yet with the Ombudsman's person's office, and I think that there absolutely could be a role for the state agencies in supporting counties in this and supporting, uh, you know, collaborating with us around um, the learning community and creating the resources for the learning community. So um, I am making a note uh, of who put this question forward, and I will be following up um, uh, with that individual to talk further about how we can loop you in. So thank you for that question. Uh, the next question uh, for you, Tia, is also one around the uh, uh, about eligibility for participation in the learning community, um, whether uh, a runaway and homeless youth program who doesn't specifically serve foster youth would have access to participate in the learning community. So at this time, and again, Debbie, correct me if I'm wrong, since we're both um, working on the learning community together, um, it is the law is um, relevant to um, foster youth. Am I correct on this, Debbie? Correct. Yes. Um, and so at this time, we would not be opening it up to um, those that are working with um, runaway homeless youth. Um, how? You know. However, that doesn't mean that there's not something that's going to be happening in the future, um, and whatever resources that we have, you are more than welcome to um, access as well. Great. So the next question is, um, you know, you mentioned, so this law is already in place and uh, that the, the, what the law specifically requires is that 
social workers and probation officers for youth who are in foster care after the age of 16, uh, that they document in the case plan who is going to be supporting foster youth with the uh, with applications for for college and financial aid, and was there an ACL or anything that came out that can help guide a, a social worker about sort of where exactly are they supposed to put that information and kind of the logistics of that? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, there was an ACL that came out, uh, I believe it was in 2018 um, that I will absolutely send out as well as a follow-up. Um, and in the ACL was um, screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions on where um, where to actually document in that case plan um, who was the identified individual. So I will send out um, the ACL as well in the follow-up emails. Great. Uh, next question is, uh, well, there's a couple of questions that I think speak to sort of just a need for some additional clarification about what a learning community is and sort of who participate, who who are the participants. So there's a couple of questions about um, getting uh, getting a child into a learning community um, or specific youth. So can you kind of clarify kind of who the target audience is for this learning community? Yeah, um, so the target audience um, at this time is not for the youth. It is for the child welfare agencies and probation agencies that are working with the youth. So child welfare workers and probation workers. Um, and so this would be um, those that are working with the youth. Now they could be connecting the youth to additional resources and foster support programs and to their um, local resources. Um, but this learning community is only reserved for um, those that are child welfare and probation um, probation officers, workers that are working with the youth. Great. Uh, so the next question is about the role of the court system. Um, the, the attorneys that are assigned to represent youth and the judges and whether they're, the learning community is going to, um, to delve into sort of what the role of the attorneys and judges would be and how the child welfare agency can be uh, collaborating or the county can can create a role for those entities in this process. I'm sorry, can you reframe the question? Whether the learning community is going to be tackling the issue of attorneys and judges and how those entities can support SB 12 implementation. Um, yes, I would imagine that that would be also a, a topic um, that we are going to be make sure that we're covering. Um, yes. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add to that that um, you know from sort of uh, anecdotally kind of our experience with SB 12 implementation thus far, there are definitely counties who uh, have who have really um, where the the court system has really stepped up themselves to play a role in SB 12 implementation and monitoring the case plans and ensuring that 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 young person or sorry that the support person is identified uh, and you know attorneys can also be monitoring that and support play a supporting role around enforcement of SP 12 provisions. So that will certainly be a piece of the conversation. Um, the next question has to do with whether we have materials in uh, languages other than English. And so I know we have a couple of resources in Spanish maybe you want to mention. Um, yes, so we have um, our financial aid guides are in English and in Spanish. Um, we do also have an educational planning guide that is in Spanish. Um, and I believe the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Debbie, our um, caregiver um, dreams to degrees training um, is also offered in Spanish. Yeah, we do have some training materials in Spanish as well. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I'll just add at this time, we don't have the capacity to create materials and uh, we haven't had the capacity to create materials in languages other than uh, Spanish uh, besides English. But there are, you know, the California Student Aid Commission and there are other entities uh, that may have some some specific resources uh, beyond just English and Spanish. And so uh, if that's a need that participants in the learning community have, you know, we can definitely do some research to see where there might be some other uh, materials in different languages. So I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. If you have any questions, I'm going to wait another five seconds to see if we get anything else in before we close. Uh, 
Um, so I'm not seeing anything. So uh, Tia, do you want to close us out? I sure can. Thank you so much, Debbie. Alrighty, so um, in you know, in closing, we do have, as I had mentioned before, um, there is the on our web on our website at jbay.org um, or on college um, California College Pathways. We have um, numerous resources. Um, if you are on the call and you are not someone who could part um, participate in the learning community, um, that you're not a um, a child welfare worker or probation officer, um, then we do have extra resources. Um, or maybe you're just, you don't have the capacity right now to um, participate in the learning community. Um, so we do have a social worker toolkit that does, again, go through some step-by-step some -step ways to implement this into your county. Um, we do, again, have the financial aid guide that is offered in Spanish, and it's an extensive step-by-step -step guide um, to support foster youth to complete the financial aid application. Um, and then, of course, we have our ed planning guide, um, our educational planning guide, that's also offered in Spanish um, that has detailed steps on um, how to support youth beginning in the sixth grade um, to get to college. Um, and thank you so much everyone for joining us again that you will be receiving a follow-up email with the application um, including the ACL that has gone out um, and other information including this uh, recording and the presentation. Um, this is our contact information here on the screen so if you have any questions um, please reach out to one of us and we'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you so much for joining us today.